welcome everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and for people of the future that are watching this, hello. <laughs> um, so what I'm planning to do is spend um, the first part of this presentation, probably by the first 30 minutes, and talk about the impact of machine learning. So we won't get to sort of the Java part or the second half, and then we'll talk about uh, a new standard for, for machine learning uh, with Java, not Python, with Java, uh, visual recognition. So we'll talk about that and I'll show uh, a couple of demos in uh, about this really cool API that we worked on. So um, again, we're gonna learn all about uh, machine learning uh, along with Java. So for the first half, let's just like kind of like sit back and, and I'll talk about machine learning from a really, really high level and talk about why you really should not ignore machine learning. And then the second half, let's dive into some Java code and look at how we can create a little, uh, little demo and how to use visual recognition with Java and see how easy it is. So there's me. And when you get the slides, as you can see, that's, uh, that's how you reach me. If you have any questions, certainly follow up with me uh, any way possible. Okay, as, as I said, the first the first part we'll talk about machine learning and uh, then we'll dive into Java code and there's there is a chat so any any uh, questions uh, hopefully I'll remember every few minutes to stop and check out any questions in the chat so feel free just to fire away, but just sit back and let, let's uh, let's talk about machine learning. So we know that machine learning is this big, big trend. And you know, of course, we, we read all our blog posts and, and um, magazine articles, et cetera, et cetera, how, how it's such an important trend. You know, it's an, and I consider it to be on a parallel with things like electricity and printing press and, and even the invention of the computer, the picture on the left there. Um, and uh, for those that don't know, the computer in that picture is actually the women in those in that picture were called computers, which is kind of a kind of a funny story. Not not the machine, but the but the ladies in the room were were the real heroes. Uh, they were the computers. So, um, as as you're going to find out with my background, um, I did a little bit of um, machine learning of past four years. And I was also interested in patterns when I was uh, an undergraduate and graduate student. And as I looked at what I was doing with machine learning and learning about the past four years, I came to this conclusion that machine learning is, is an inflection point for not just computing and not just for companies, enterprises, but it's an inflection point for countries, humanity, and civilization. And I'm not kidding. This is no exaggeration. This is not like a little framework that you learn. Uh, a little Java framework that you learn to to, uh, um, to parse numbers or parse JSON. To me, this is a huge, huge trend for, for civilization. So here's, here's how I found out. So patterns. So let me take it back back when I was a, a, an undergraduate. Um, you know, undergraduate, we had to go to a computer lab. We didn't have laptops. So that's how far back I go, uh, which is quite a while back. So um, I would go to the... Uh, the computer lab, and I sat next to this big disk drive, that picture on the upper left. Uh, it was just my favorite seat because the disk drive was nice and warm and I liked the heat, so I sat next to the disk drive. Um, and it, it made noises, right? So um, it's just a noisy, de noisy device. It wasn't solid state. We didn't have solid state drives back then. And it, um, based upon what people were doing with the machine, it made certain noises, right? And I recall this, this, this guy came into the computer lab regularly. So this dude came in the back and he, and he ran his program. And I noticed that whenever he ran his program, the drive made a certain noise. So the arm was going back and forth, you know, sort of with the Winchester, old fashioned Winchester technology, and it was making a lot of noise. And I would like look around and say, there's that, there's that guy again. And then the next day, um, I heard the noise and I turned around and there's the same dude in the back of the room. So I thought, okay, he's running this program. So it was kind of interesting. And then one day I heard the noise and I told myself, yep, that guy's going to be back there behind me. And sure enough, I turned my head in the back of the room was this, was that guy. So I, I kind of, kind of laughed at that. I said, like, you know what? I was actually predicting the future. I knew from that sound, but the, but the, the, uh, the disk drive made, I predicted that there was this guy in the back of the room. And I sort of like kind of laughed at that. Um, but I kept that thought with me, like for years and years and years, how I was able to predict the future by not by looking for that guy in the back of the room, but by something else. So 
you know, some of you um, that have seen me talk before know that I'm also a musician. Um, and my undergraduate um, project was looking at original music, original melodies, and then, uh, or looking at pa past melodies and creating an original melody in a certain style. I mean, now, I mean, that's open source and you can buy that, you know, commercial product for like, you know, less than a few dollars. Um, so I had these probability trees that I built and I looked at patterns in the notes and it was just a melody. Just, and then uh, just for fun, I decided to kind of draw out, draw out the staff with the notes and everything like that, just to make it fun. You know, a little eye candy. Whenever you do a project, here's a, here's a tip. Always have a little eye candy for your manager. <laughs> it always, always helps. So I created this thing and it was able to transpose, you know, different keys that going up or going down. So I, I looked at patterns. You know, and, and oddly enough, there's another thing about eye candy, that even though I had this really cool internal system that looked at probability trees and, and all kinds of, you know, trying out sequences and patterns, and everybody in the room was fascinated by how I drew the staff. <laughs> and I was, I was able to transpose things. They were asking me more questions about the graphics, the natural part, you know, most important part of the code. So um, eye candy is important for, for demos. Um, so later on in my career, um, I worked for the New York Stock Exchange, um, and we looked at uh, insider trading. And what we did is that, I, I mean, I was lucky to work with a, a team of early AI um, computer scientists, um, AI scientists and computer scientists. Uh, I, you know, I was the, the young kid on the team, and I was the UI person. Uh, but we were looking for patterns for insider trading. So we're looking for all kinds of illegal trading based upon patterns. So there was that word again, patterns. So I, I did my stint there. Um, and then I worked for an investment bank. Uh, we were managing portfolios, you know, large, large, you know, multi-billion dollar portfolios or even hundreds of millions of dollars for large companies. And we told them that we can, uh, we can tell what, you know, what your portfolio is doing by looking at patterns. Right. And we told them, we actually told them, which was kind of a lie, but we told them that we can tell, we can tell you why your portfolio went up or down. I mean, certainly in the past few weeks, <laughs> things were going down, but uh, we told them we can, we can tell why your portfolio was going up and down, which is kind of a stretch. I mean, if you looked at their portfolio and you see a big chunk of it was going down, we said, well, that's the reason It's because you invested in that one thing. That's why it went down. But that wasn't really a reason. Right? That was just like a component of your portfolio affected the entire portfolio. So it's not wasn't a reason, but, but we so we're kind of, you know, it's like kind of like a white lie. What we really want to do is that we want to search for a correlation engine, like find out a pattern. Did something happen in the world that caused your portfolio to go up or down? Not just like what component of portfolio, but what pattern caused that? Did something happen in, on the world? Did something happen economically, politically? Or was there a natural disaster? But we tried to find uh, um, this causation engine, or correlation engine, but we, but we gave up. But I noticed that all this stuff was about patterns. You know, I was, I was kind of fascinated with patterns. Even when I worked way back at you know, Bell Labs, I was fascinated with fractal patterns. And here I was a musician, musical patterns. So this, this word patterns came up a lot. And then I kind of, it kind of took us, you know, put my head up a little bit. And, and instead of looking at, you know, coding, um, I started looking at, wait a minute, there's musical patterns. So if I'm playing guitar with my friend, I tell him it's a blues and one, four, five, and C. My friend knows how to play that pattern. If I said, we're going to do a two, five, one in the key of G in a jazz, some jazz song, they know how to play because it it's a pattern. If you play sports, you know that to beat your opponent, you have to know the patterns of your opponent, right? Whether you play um, European football or you play American football where we don't use our feet uh, in American football, it was, that was also about patterns. Then there's patterns in business, right? And even in astronomy, I was fascinated, you know, like when I started out uh, in undergrad, I wanted to be an astrophysicist. I wasn't a computer science person then. I was. I wanted to be an astrophysicist, and I noticed that there were correlations between how stars behaved and how innovations occurred, and how things explode with you know, like just like an innovation explodes. 
but then it kind of shrinks into a more stable state. And I said, wait a minute, that's how innovation works. And so in animals to do this, right? How does a bear know where to fish? It knows about patterns. It knows where the salmon is, is in the water and it knows that's where to get my food. So this was interesting to me. It's like, these different things, the, the thing about it was patterns. So then I, I sort of like went into the computer field, right? And of course we all know what regular expressions are. So regular expressions were invented in the 1940s. Um, Stephen Clean, if I remember correctly, invented regular expressions. Now, why did he invent regular expressions? Well, back in the 40s, I think it's 1946, uh, neural networks, which we use nowadays in machine learning. So neural networks was first um, invented in 1946. Artificial neural networks, you know, same as our brain, but artificial neural networks. So Stephen Kling was very interested in that. And he's, he wanted to find a mathematical connection to neural networks. So he invented variable expressions to experiment with neural networks to find patterns, specifically to find patterns in text. So regular expressions are looking at patterns, right? That's what regular expressions are. They look at textual patterns. And we come up with uh, really sometimes a very complicated way to express that, that uh, pattern. And that's where the term regular comes from. It's a mathematical term to, to, find, to find matches of that pattern. So here I went into the computer field and it's like, there's something else that was a pattern. So, and we all know about this book, right? So um, for, for your younger developers, I mean, this is a book back in the mid nineties that we all used to codify what we were doing for years and years and years. So like looking at these idioms that we're using and, and let's turn them into design patterns, like okay, specific design patterns. So that's 95. So this book, was patterned after a talk by Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham at, a, at an Oopsla conference. The object number did uh, systems language and architecture, if I remember correctly, um, conference. So they had a talk about pattern languages. So this book was patterned after a talk on patterns. So Ward, was influenced by this book. So his pattern language talk was patterned <laughs> on this book. This book was a pattern language for construction and not for software construction, but for building construction. So this book influenced the first wiki and it influenced Agile. So it was a pattern for a pattern for a pattern. And not only that, but building patterns have been around for quite a long time. So the, so the next time you, you create a, a facade pattern or decorator pattern, um, note that what you're doing it is not just a few years old, but it comes from building construction patterns from many, many hundreds of years ago. And some of this looks like some of my software actually, software construction. So there are patterns based upon patterns upon patterns. And then in business, there's, there's books on patterns or problems on for books. There's, there's enterprise patterns, there's technology patterns, right? There's clothing patterns, there's fishing patterns, there's items how found a book on bloodstain patterns, there's cultural patterns. So I, I sort of like look at this, like there's something, there's something here, there's something here, but you know, that that there has to be a connection to what I'm doing in the computer field with, with patterns. And, and just to, to just not to belabor the whole thing about patterns, but here's an very, very um, what I thought was fascinating um, thing about patterns. Right? So in, in France, the, there's the uh, um, the engineers and the, the commuting um, engineers built this whole system of, of trains in, 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 uh, in France that connects all the major cities. So scientists, some biological scientists uh, were studying slime molds and which is quite fascinating. Slime molds, obviously there's no brain it behaves like a brain. So they created something that looked like France and they put the slime mold's food where major cities were. And then they filmed it. And of course, slime mold moves very slowly. So it was time-lapse photography. But what was interesting is that 
the network that the slime mold created was identical to the train system in France. So it was a pattern. So what's going on here? Is, is there something that's, that's, um, that's pretty significant, I thought. So patterns are everywhere. They're everywhere. Right, so so um, they're not just like worldwide, but they're universal. I mean, like they're truly universal. Like they they there's patterns to to star behavior, and and nova and supernova behavior. So let's let's uh, get back to planet Earth here and, and talk about traditional computing. So we've been doing traditional computing for many decades, right? So for for most applications, the algorithms are are well defined. Uh, um, you know, calculate bowling averages. Uh, you know, the total of money from train turnstiles, calculate things from GitHub. I mean, things we've done for like many, many years, right? And our software sort of looks like a, a like a pachinko game, right? It's like you kind of like, okay, if then, if then is, and maybe there's a loop here and there, but it's just a bunch of if thens and loops, right? That's our traditional software. So, so we have to come up with, so we, uh, uh, instead of the machine, we come up with an architecture and code and the machine follows our code. So that's traditional software. But some algorithms are not well-defined. So let's look at, for example, visual recognition. So here, here's two pictures. And I wanted to tell the difference between the picture on the left and the picture on the right. So I have like a, a chihuahua on the left and I have a muffin on the right. Um, when I gave this talk, when I gave this talk in Nigeria <laughs> to a bunch of graduate students, uh, they didn't know what a chihuahua was and they didn't know what a muffin was. So I had to quickly find out that uh, just to call the thing on our left a puppy and the thing on our right, I think I called it that, I had to call it a cupcake instead of a muffin. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of funny. I thought everybody knew what a chihuahua was, but apparently that, that wasn't true. So if you had to write code that differentiated between a chihuahua and a muffin, you'd have to say, okay, the chihuahua, okay, there's like three dark areas. So if we have three dark areas, and if we have some uh, white colored area in the center, and if it's light brown, and looks like there's two ears there, I think, um, and maybe just like whiskers. Okay, so there's a bunch of you know rules, and the thing on the right. Okay, so maybe the eyes aren't symmetric. There's there's like a, a muffin, like a container for for the for the muffin. Uh, there's some blueberries, or so I would come up with with a set of rules. And then uh, you know, the manager comes over and says, oh, you're, you're ready to go, we're go we wanna go into production. So, I, right, I have my rules, we're going to production. So, so, so here's the production. So here's the production data. It's like, whoa, uh, okay, um, is the thing in the upper left, is, is that a chihuahua? The, the, wait a minute, there's three circles there. I didn't, did I say three circles? So is maybe that's a muffin, not a, muff, uh, not a chihuahua. What about the one next to it in the, uh, the second square there? Oh, well, that's a chihuahua, but its head is slanted. And then the next one. So if you notice that my rules, um, after a while, I have to constantly add more rules. And, you know, if after a while, it's not dozens of rules, it's not hundreds of rules, but maybe it's thousands of rules to make sure I differentiate between a chihuahua or a muffin because you don't want the chihuahua to be eaten like the muffin. So you gotta be really careful. With, with your code. So if you notice that um, if I had used an expert system built rules, I would have thousands of rules, many thousands of rules, right? And in some applications like the weather, we have millions, right? So millions of variables. So expert systems after a while um, aren't scalable, right? You can't use expert systems because the complexity, what I call the complexity index, the complexity in the index goes up. And like I tell my students, when the complexity index goes up, what else goes up? The chance for bugs, right? So, so this is a problem. But where else is this applied? Well, it turns out that any application that has tons of parameters and lots of data. So where's that? Well, everywhere. It turns out in healthcare and in farming, uh, anti-spam, weather certainly, uh, the FinTech, Secure cybersecurity, um, autonomous cars, autonomous uh, trucks, call centers. Call centers are, are are very interesting. I mean, there are some countries that uh, their GDP um, depends on revenue from call centers, like India. Um, so there's a lot of these problems, a lot of these big problems, right? 
can't you can't uh, solve those problems with expert systems. So here comes machine learning. So what is the core of machine learning? So what I've just said over the past like 25 minutes. So what machine learning is, it's recognizing patterns in data, whether it's visual data or non-visual data, and making predictions against that data. So it's recognizing patterns in data and making predictions. And if you wanted to, uh, you know, uh, talk to your boss and your boss says like we we, we want to do machine learning, but I don't understand what machine learning. Can you tell them what it is? So this here's a line. Look, here's a line that you should tell your your, man, your manager. So that machine learning is all about recognizing patterns in our data, and so we can anticipate the likely behavior of similar data. And the third and most important part is that what steps do we take to maximize benefit based upon those predictions? Right. So we recognize patterns. We can predict the future to a certain degree, right? Just like the weather. And then the most important thing, take steps to maximize ethical business benefit based upon those predictions. So it's predictions, uh, it's, it's um, patterns, uh, predictions or prescriptions. And this, this researcher said this back in, in, the, in, the, in the 40s, right? He said the most interesting aspect of the world is made up of patterns. So this is not a, a new concept. It's just that it hasn't been popularized up until recently, right? Now, this is certainly way different than traditional computing that we've all been doing for years and years and years, right? So what we've been doing is that, so we have data, right? Every app has a bunch of data and then we have a model. Okay, the model is in our heads, right? Our collections of algorithms, the steps that we take, you know, the loops and the if statements and all that stuff, our model uh, of what we want to, the problem we want to solve goes into the machine with their data and we get a result, right? We get a result. So that's the typical way we solve problems. But machine learning is different. Machine learning is we're inputting lots of data, right? And now with, with cloud, you know, cloud storage being probably the biggest, one of the biggest use cases for the cloud, we have tons and tons of data and we want a certain result, right? So like, for example, if you had data, um, you, wanna, you wanna to predict whether you should give someone a mortgage, a house mortgage, right? And you know that you're gonna look at their um, income, uh, maybe a couple's income, what, what type of house they buy, is their primary residence, is secondary residence, um, do you have any side income, uh, do you have children? You know, all, all these factors, and it could be, you know, many, many dozens of variables. And if, if you know that a, a couple fits certain criteria, you know that, yes, we should give that couple a mortgage, right, if you work for a, a bank. So you know what the result is. So you're asking the computer, give me the model that generates that result, right? So this is different than, than traditional computing, where tra traditional computing is is the top, is that we have something in our heads, right? We have an architecture, we have a set of algorithms, we have steps, we have code that we wanna to give to the machine along with data to get a result. Machine learning is different, right? We know the result, this is the result that we want, that given these criteria, if a couple has these attributes and, and th these values, um, yes, we can give them a mortgage. But how did, the, how did you arrive at that? Well, you're asking the computer, Give me the model on, uh, on getting that output. So I know what I want already. I want you to tell me how do I get that output? So it's a different way of thinking. Now let's, let's talk about JSR 3D1. So what is JSR 3D1? Well, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Zoran Trevars from Serbia, um, Zoran and I were giving talks at Java 1. You know, Java one and then code one and um, separate talks. Um, and we, we got together, you know, we're part of the, the, uh, the house band for, for Java one, uh, the no pointers. So, so uh, we sort of said, you know, we're, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about machine learning in Java. So why don't we kind of put, put our heads together and so like, you know, we need to do something for, for Java developers. Um, because whenever um, people want to do machine language, uh, machine learning, 
you get uh, you get this statement. You you can write. I'm kind of borrowing from from Henry Ford here. You can write your machine learning app in any language you want as long as it's Python, right? So then, if you're a Java developer, so well, wait a minute. I mean, you tell me that now I have to I have to learn Python to do machine learning. So there's there's 10 million over 10 million Java developers out there. You're going to tell 10 million Java developers you have to learn Python to do to do machine learning. So it's that what's wrong with that picture? So so we, so Zorin and I kind of said like you know what what does Java need? Well, it's like we don't want you know, we didn't want another JavaScript, we call it a doomsday scenario. So what I mean by that is that, so here, the web was invented you know, back in the late 80s, you know, Tim Berners-Lee came up with the web and it got popularized in the 90s, right? Uh, but there was only one language for the web, it was only JavaScript. So here we have this like, you know, the singularity in, in civilization and we can only program one language. So it's like if you had a bunch of musicians, I said like, here's a clarinet. I want you to express all of your, you know, musical emotions with a clarinet. Go. You can't, right? Everybody has a different way of expressing themselves. So we didn't want what, what we call a, a JavaScript doomsday scenario. I didn't want that to happen, right? Now, Python is a good language. It's really, it's a very, very good language. But there should be other languages to to express your your creativity, right? And certainly, as a Java developer, you know, as a Java champion, I wanted to, to use Java. And so when, when Zorn and I looked around at what was available out there, we, we looked at all the APIs. They were not Java friendly. They were all like C language things that had you know, crappy Java wrappers around them. So they weren't Java friendly. They weren't Java, Java tooling. So they, they, weren't, they weren't Java friendly. So um, we, we kept that in mind. So we have, we have to do something. So I had a talk with uh, a, an ML researcher at a conference, and we sat down at this, this little cafe. And for two hours, um, we talked about Java and ML. So this, this, uh, my friend Humphrey, um, he was a, a Java developer for 20 years. And he was told that he's now leading an ML project. And he had to learn Python. And he said that, and then I had to deploy it. He said, like, it, it was, yet yeah, Python was great for prototyping. He said, but deployment was, was a headache. So we sat down for two hours over uh, maybe a bottle or two of good wine <laughs> at this cafe. And we came up with, like, a list of things that what Java needed. So if, if you want to go to, there's that URL down at the bottom. It, it's, a, it's a really, really good uh, article on what, uh, what we thought that Java needed. So we needed to promote Java for ML. And, you know, of course, there's a famous computer scientist, Alan Kay, who gave us a lot of uh, what we use today in our machines. The best way to predict the future is to do it yourself, is to invent it. So we took that to heart. So Zara and I said, like, you know what? We're going to build some job ML libraries for Java developers. And we went to all the big companies and we said, like, are you interested in using Java for machine learning? And we were actually kind of shocked that all these big companies said, yes, we want to use Java. We want to deploy machine learning in Java. I mean, these are not small companies like, you know, Google, Amazon, IBM, Oracle, Twitter. They, they all said, we want to deploy Java because we're used to deploying Java. We know what the, what the business practices are and the patterns are for deploying Java. We want to use Java for ML. Uh, and I had a nice conversation with Brian Getz um, at, at uh, QCon uh, some years back about ML and how Java is moving towards uh, having more ML features over tensors. So all the big companies were interested in this. So uh, Zorn and I and uh, one of our colleagues, Kevin, um, from at that point, Open Value, we, we got together along with some other colleagues, some of these people I'm sure you're very well aware, um, people from Amazon, from IBM, Oracle, Google, helped us build JSR 381. As a matter of fact, um, after we have it standardized, Amazon took our API, right? Because JSRs are APIs, right? They took our API and implemented our API using their own deep Java li libraries or their DJL, right? So they implemented our API with DJL. So uh, we thought that was, wow, this is, Am I mean, Amazon did that, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So they took uh, deep interest in JSR 31. And thanks to our colleague there, Frank Liu, who, who implemented that. So what JSR 3D1 is, um, so instead of 
coming up with one uh, ML API for for everything. I mean, that's like you know, oil the ocean type of thing. I mean, it's, as a, as a, as a manager, you never want to do that, right? Let's pick something, pick a problem that you can solve. So we looked at visual recognition. So that's a subset of ML. So we looked at visual recognition to solve that because certainly that's a that's like maybe boiling a pond rather than boiling the ocean. So it, it was um, visual recognition object, you know, computer vision using ML, right? And it also provided a generic ML API available to anybody using the API. But the important thing that it was designed for Java developers. It was not, it, it's pure Java. It's not a C language thing that and that's, that's a, with a crappy Java wrapper around it. And it's not for data scientists. Right? You don't have to study statistics and study machine learning, uh, excuse me, data science to be uh, to write a machine learning application. It's for Java developers. So here, here's how we how we uh, designed and, and built it. So right, all the other ML, you know, there's a there's like ten different uh, ML um, machine learning APIs out there um, for Java, but they're all different. They're all different, right? Different algorithms, image classes. And the typical Java developers does, doesn't understand a lot of the advanced things they have to know about statistics, and data science, right? So there were all these different, different problems. So here's where our goal is that we wanted to build an API that was for Java developers. And it was easy to implement for people um, that, have, that have engines like, uh, like, like Amazon to, to implement using their engine. Right, and it was for design for Java developers. That's that's what I want to stress. It was not designed for data scientists who happen to know Java. It was designed for 10 million Java developers. And here's a really high level architecture. Um, so the the, uh, the thing that light, light orange is is the public API, and under underneath that we have our internal uh, software that we wrote, and we had to come up with an image abstraction because there were like bitmaps and. Uh, there's a bunch of different classes to handle images from, from different things. So we had to come up with an abstraction for that. Um, and then at the bottom, we use Java's SPI, the uh, service provider interface. So on, on one engine, uh, like for example, DeepNets has a nice ML engine. So for, for the DeepNets engine, we have uh, a, a service provider interface implemented for that engine. There's one that Amazon implemented. So they have an, uh, for their ML engine. So they provided that implementation. We're hoping to get some other ones soon. So there's a, three, a third one and a, possibly a fourth one. So the VizRack, this we affectionately call it VizRack, JSR381, has a public API, just like any other JSR. It is an API that needs an implementation, right? But the API is standard. So you can move your app, right? It, it's obviously why we have APIs, right? So let's see if I can show some some code here. We'll get rid of this guy. And uh, you know what? Maybe I can show some. Let me show a few slides on on, on the uh, the demo about the show. So th there's a normal way that you do an ML um, application, right? You you pre prepare the data, make sure it's unbiased and clean. That's that can take up you know 85 percent of your effort. Um, and then you train, you build a model, right? And you test them on, you tune it and then you put it into production. So there's like these three basic phases, but for the demo, we're just gonna, you know, look at some data, or we're gonna train the model and we're predicting, kind of make it simple just, just for the demo. So my, my demo uh, looks at uh, dogs, and uh, I think it's have chihuahuas and another type of dog in there. Um, so I'm gonna train uh, using JSR 3 one I'm gonna train uh, a model on a certain type of dog, Right, and I'm using this public data set from Stanford that there's, the, there's a URL for that uh, public data set. And my demo only used 872 images, which is quite small. I mean, typically using many thousands of images, but uh, I'm just using 872, that's all I had for, for uh, Chihuahua. I think I'll use Chihuahuas and some other species of dog, but so I have those, all right? So here's, there's sort of two components. I wanna write a Java program that creates the model, right? So it creates the model and I save the model into a file. And then my second program is gonna read that model file. It's like a, basically I'm putting it in production. I'm reading that, reading that model file 
And then I'm giving it new data. I said, is this a dog? Is this one's a dog? Is that one a dog? And then I'm going to get a, a probability back. So, so probability meaning like, it's just like the weather, right? When, when the weather is forecast for tomorrow is, it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Well, is it going to be sunny tomorrow? Well, no, it's, you have an 85% chance it's going to be sunny tomorrow. It's, it's not given it's going to be 100%. You have probably an 85% chance it's going to be sunny. So, so there's two components to this. So here's the first part. This is creating the model. So we have a, a traditional builder pattern, and there's our word again, pattern. So I'm looking at images. So I'm using the buffered image class. I uh, give it the height and width. Um, a labels file is what objects am I looking at? And the labels file, I'll show you the example here. The labels file just says, these are dogs. And the training file is the images right here. The training file is a set of, uh, it's an index into the images. Like here's this image and this is a dog. Here's this image, that's a dog. Here's this image, that's a dog. Here's this image, that's a dog. And I'll show you when I get to IntelliJ here. Um, here's, I'm gonna export the model to this file. Um, the maximum error, if I want like, you know, 90% accuracy or I want the 95% accuracy, a maximum number of epics. Epic is just an iteration, how many times you wanna kind of go through all this and then, and then create the model, all right? So, here, here's uh, here's four new new photographs, right? There's four new images. I'm, let me go back to show you my original images, right? These were there's 872 of these, and here's four new images that I didn't use that I didn't use during a training, and I ran the uh, the model on these, right? And here's here's running the the uh, this is the second program, right? Uh, get the classifier. I'm, I'm using images the same height and width and get, get the model file, so pretty simple. And then here are my predictions. I'm gonna look at one, two, the, the mushroom and three. So for the first one, it's, I get an 85.88, excuse me, 88.54% chance that's a, that's a chihuahua. I, this one is 88.68, it's a chihuahua. Actually, to be correct, it's, it's a dog image because <laughs> um, there are chihuahuas and other dogs. And, and the mushroom was 66.4% that it was a dog. So that's really unusual. So I'm, I'm gonna get that in a second. And then here's the last one is 87.8% that was uh, a dog. So here's, here's those numbers. So um, actually, let me just see if anybody asking any, any questions in the, uh, in the chat here. Okay. Not yet. Okay. So let me uh, run that. Um, this my mushroom thing down here. Okay. So here's my training program. Right, and I just uh, let's see where. Right. So here's here's how, here's where I'm training. Let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. Hopefully that's readable. Uh, here's here's where I'm an, an image recognizer. An image recognizer is just my class. So it's just a wrapper around the, the builder. I just needed to put it on one page. So just like what I showed you in that slide, um, the image class with height, labels file. Let's let's look at some of this stuff. So labels file, labels file. All it is is like okay. So I have two things I want to classify what I call an alpha dog or mushrooms, I probably should just have called dogs and mushrooms. Okay, so, uh, oops, sorry, sorry. Um, the training file, let's look at the training file. Let's look at the training file. Training file. Training file. Oops. Sorry, training file. Okay, so here, training file is all these images up here. So for example, right? So these are all, this is the, the file that, um, this is the set of image files that I'm training um, the model on. Um, and I'm telling it that I want it a, a certain, you know, I want 90% accuracy and don't go past, you know, a hundred iterations. And, and you, you use these things like these, these variables um, to 
I can I can say give me like fifty percent fifty percent accuracy and only do five iterations of building the model. Yeah, you know, the model file would probably be created in like you know ten minutes, five minutes. If I said I want I wanted ninety five percent accuracy and and keep on doing this until the error rate gets close to you know close to five or, or close to zero, um, it could take many hours. As a matter of fact, when I built this model for this demo. Um, I had a long dinner, <laughs> so I let this run for, for several hours, and it built it built this model file. So I'm sorry for the scroll, fast scrolling there, but uh, my model file. I don't know why IntelliJ won't let me blow up. Yeah, but um, so if you can see this model.dnet. So that's the file that I said, put the model file into that, this guy. I just backed it up just for in case something went wrong, but that is the model. And I told, I told uh, that said, that's the name of the file I wanna use. So if I were to run this thing, it, it would return in a couple hours with that, with that file. Okay, so that's where you, knew you need you know, compute power. Um, and as some of you might've read, said sometimes you have to use GPUs or specialized AI hardware to make that go faster. And we're doing this in pure Java. And then now to use the model, use the model, okay. So uh, this is gonna be fairly fast. So let me um, let the train, not train. Uh, To use it, I, I create this uh, neural net image classifier. I get the model file, and that's all I have to do. And I say, just classify. Right? It's just something to classify. So I could run this guy. This guy is identified. Frank, did you say GPU support was in scope for the JSR or not? I missed it. No, so, so the JSR is an API. So we're, we're relying on implementations of Right. So, for example, we use DeepNet's implementation, which is pure Java, that does not have GPU. Uh, Amazon uh, doesn't have GPU, uh, but a future one could, but it doesn't change our API. Right. Okay, got it. Okay, so uh, sir, notice that uh, here, actually, that's pretty slow, um, probably because I ran it for the first time. So in about a second, 1.2 seconds, it used the model that says, okay, the first one is 88%, the next one is 88.6%. The mushroom is 66%. So when I first ran this, I was like, well, that's actually, that's not too good, right? So, but there's a, uh, there's a clear reason why. So I only use 672 images. So um, Alfred Eng, one of the big names in, in uh, ML, he said the rule of thumb is that you really should have like 10,000 images to be really accurate. So here I'm only using 672 images. So you notice that I, I, my program needs more training because so it shouldn't be 66% from mushroom, right? That's certainly not a chihuahua. <laughs> so I need to train it against um, for further um, images of dogs and certainly way more than 672 images. So that, that's, um, that's a problem for me to, to, to do next time. But it was interesting, it was educational for me. Um, and think I would I thought that 670 image was fine, but it turns out nope, that is not that is not fine. You need to give it as much data as possible. So that was educational for me. Okay, so here's the second one. So uh, actually Zorn wrote this is kind of a funny one. I mean, I think we all remember uh, the Silicon Valley um, series on uh, HBO. It's one of my favorite documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> so is the demo hot dog or not hot dog? Um, I mean, you have to watch that episode. So and then that's the link to the episode. That that episode was so much on the mark about machine learning. It, it, it wasn't funny. I mean, it was funny, it, it, but it was that very accurate, um, but extremely funny. So they wanted to detect whether something was a hot dog or not. So here's what Zorn wrote. And I think he just did it in like one, one evening. So uh, here's a Maven. There's only two dependencies you have to worry about. So my program used Gradle, um, and Zorn just happened to use Maven. 
um, there's sort of two dependencies. There's the, um, there's the API, of course, the J JSR's API. The second one is the reference implementation. So this particular implementation is um, the deep nets implementation. Okay, and if you're using some other one, you would have it would be a different dependency, right? And here's very similar to, to um, this code that I showed you, and you can get the full source code for this, right? So in, and here's it. It's running the uh, the training, and um, his every iteration is taking looks like 3.8 seconds, 3.7 seconds, 3.9 seconds. So it's only a few seconds in each iteration. But if you're doing that for 100 iterations, it's, it takes some time. Um, for my app, you know, it was taking quite a long time because I wanted to be very accurate. So as I said, I went for a long dinner, like a two hour dinner, and I came back and it was just about finishing. Okay. And this is similar to my code and showing the actual recognition, which is very, very fast. And then you look at, um, I will look at hot dog. It said, is, is there, is that picture of this new hot dog? Actually, here it is, pizza. So here's a picture of a pizza, but I wanna say, is that a hot dog? And I should get, no, it's not a hot dog, but it's either, if it's above 50% saying it's a hot dog, if it's low, it's not. I kind of tweaked that a little bit. I'll, I'll show you in the code. So let's see. And I'm not sure we'll look at the details, but let's see where to put my. Okay, so here's the hot dog and not hot dog. And here's the training. And if you notice, it's very similar to my program. Um, and it's trained upon images of hot dogs. And over here, yeah, you know, IntelliJ allows me to increase the font of this, right? Like this, and it allows me to do this. It doesn't allow me to increase the font of this pane. So here's all these images of hot dogs, for example, right? So we fed it all these images of hot dogs. Uh, and here's a classifier, right? So it builds a model of what hot dogs are. And then to run it, here's, here's the second program, right? With the first one program created the model. The second one is using the model. So, and so, okay, there's the model right there. And it says, okay, here's the new image, hot dog that Jake. So, where's my hot dog? That's this guy. So, we're going to find out is that a hot dog or not. So, right, that's the image that we're looking at. So, let's, let's run this. And says, wow, okay, that's pretty cool. 98% chance, this is better than the weather, predicting the weather for tomorrow, right? There's a high probability it's a hot dog, right? And I, I actually tweaked um, my colleague's code a little bit. I said, if it's above 80%, say it's high probability. If it's between 50 and 80, say it's probably. And if it's below that, say it's not a hot dog. So let me uh, change the image I'm looking at. Let's say, okay, there's, there's me, and some people have called me a hot dog. So let's uh, let's change it to to me. Let's see if the model calls me a hot dog. And thankfully, zero percent. Frank is not a hot dog. Okay. So thank goodness for that. Let me add this up. Lobster potato. JPEG. Let's look at that guy first. So that's a, that's a nice dinner that I made for my wife uh, a few months ago. So let's run this. Let's see what it says. Wow, it's only 0.02%. 0, 0 Most likely this is not a hot dog. And um, pizza, let's put a pizza in there. So the pizza, so the actually it's interesting that the, the pizza is actually close to 50%, right? So we still need more training. So that's, um, I mean, to us, I mean, obviously that the pizza that doesn't look like a hot dog, but it says 
Oh, I don't know, it's getting close to 50%. So we obviously need more training. Um, so that's um, the, the two demos, both, both uh, repositories available on GitHub. Um, skip some of this stuff here. Um, so our reference implementation is, is on this open source um, machine learning uh, engine from, from DeepNets, uh, the, the community edition. And there's also the, uh, as I said, the Amazon implementation is there. Um, there's a getting started guide. You can, you can scan that. Um, let me see the recording. There's all kinds of um, links, which um, I think all those links, yes, I think we purposely put the link there and not just uh, made the words hot there. So, and the mailing list is, is um, at the bottom. So you should join the mailing list to get more information. So that, that's JSR 3D1. And I, Zorn and I would please just ask you, like, please like use it and, and let us know what you think, right? It's, um, it's an official JSR. It's, it's really for Java developers. It's pure Java. There's no C language and it's the model and, and the program are very small. We've had people, um, Android developers, put it the entire model on their Android phones and saying that it, it's in less than a meg, they can, uh, one of our, our, our um, users was using it to detect chess pieces. And he said, it's, it's extremely small and because it's Java and he's a Java developer he said I was able to use it, you know, really, really quickly. So as, as I said before, Python is a great language. It's really good for prototyping. Um, you know, when I was in the investment banks, the, the oldest quants, all the stat, uh, People were using S plus and uh, R plus and S plus and R or R and S plus, but they're using their own stack packages. Um, but then they would hand everything over to us and say, okay, now you need to rewrite this to C plus plus to deploy it. So it's, I think like history is repeating itself or there's a word pattern again. So you build these prototypes in Python, which Python has some great, great libraries to, to, uh, to do prototyping, but to deploy it, we have 10 million Java developers that know how to deploy things in production. I mean, we know how to put things in production. So now we can take those models and use Java. So any, any questions? I mean, thank you for, for listening to this. Um, I, I, four years ago, I, I looked at this, I'm like I looked at Java back way back in the mid nineties, that it wasn't just a simple language. It, Java was just big ecosystem of things and it was way more than a simple language. That's how I look at machine learning. It's not just a, a toolkit or a set of numerical libraries. This has the potential to change civilizations. And what I mean by that is in patterns, because everything is based upon patterns. So we hope people use, this, use machine learning ethically, but obviously there are people that wear you know, the black hats in our community and they may not use it ethically. So. Um, there's there's a, a lot to learn and we're just we're still learning this is just the beginning of a of a multi-decade trend in machine learning so you got a few questions frank um uh you or you want those now yeah sure sweet okay um so let's see so uh, andrew was asking if java threading can be used to speed up the simulation yes a very very good question so um we were about to take a look at how we can use Java threading to do that. But, you know, uh, as everyone knows, the uh, Loom is coming, Project Loom is coming. Um, and there's going to be things built on top of Loom. So um, we're actually thinking about doing the lightweight threads that Loom has, um, or maybe there's going to be another toolkit on top of Loom. So, yes, we, we are looking at that. Uh, we're also looking, working with, um, of the Tornado VM, uh, Juan over there. Is, it, so their, their VM uses GPUs and we're looking at uh, just running, it's, it's a JVM. So we should be able to just run our app on top of their JVM and, and de facto use um, hardware. So yes, we're looking at all ways to, to increase performance. This is just a start, but that's, a, that's an excellent question. That's interesting because uh, when I, it was funny you mentioned that, Frank, because I was talking to Sharat a few about a month or two ago about this, um, and and he said something about Project Loom, and I, I, I didn't quite get it at the time. But um, Andrew's question and your answer just brought it into into perspective for me. So that's that's really cool. Um, 
Uh, Vivek wanted to know, um, and I think this is a, I think, let's answer Vivek's question, but I think there's a question behind Vivek's question, which is, his is, is there a project to convert Python libraries like NumPy, NumPy, you know, to, to Java? And I think, I think what he's pointing out is really valid in the sense that um, I think part of why Python's gotten so popular for, for the data engineering and the ML is just, you know, scikit-learn, NumPy, there's like all these, these packages, you know, and, and, you know, Java's always had a really strong ecosystem. You know, what's your, you know, shake the tea leaves. What's your read of the tea leaves here, Frank? You know, do you, do you see these kinds of things porting over to Java or similar efforts kind of getting started or, you know, is, is yeah, no, that's a, that's, that's another, another great question. I mean, it's, it goes back way back in the beginning of Java that there was, there were the scientific programmers that wanted to use Java and Java, you know, of course, like it had to ray bounce checking. So, uh, that that was just, that slowed down things, and and uh, when you're using more than two dimensions in an, an array, uh, that slowed that thing. So the the numeric community uh, was dissatisfied with the use of Java in the beginning. Um, so this is almost like history repeating itself. There there are um, there's a lot of Java tool tooling out there because I mean obviously Python has all these libraries, right? It has these fantastic libraries. That's why it's a great uh, prototyping. Uh, language. Uh, there are efforts to port a lot of this stuff like NumPy uh, to Java. Um, as we go on in, in time, you know, more and more libraries will be written, and hopefully these are things that Java can take take uh, advantage of. Even going even further, and then talking to Brian Getz, and Brian Getz says, you know, the notion of a tensor, right? And, and that's, you know, especially an array. Um, the notion of a tensor um, is will be in the language sometime in the future, and that will help machine learning because uh, tensor is a critical part. So uh, it's just we're, we're at the we're at the beginning of a long tail of a long long ter tail trend. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, resource heavy. That's what you mean, Andrew. Okay, got it. Um, Todd was curious if you could show the architecture file. Is that is that human readable or is that binary? Ah, I don't remember. Okay, okay. Yeah. So the architecture file. Yes. That's that's another excellent question. Let me see. If I got to find my uh, okay. The architecture file. Yes, the architecture file. Let me just show what the question. So this guy right here. So I would say if all these things, and most of these are pretty, you know, very very simple, very simple parameters. I mean, the, the width and height of an image, the the labels file, the the the, the image image uh, files themselves, uh, the errors. This one is probably the only one that's um, data sciencey. So, um, let's see if I have it. Okay. So, so this is the only thing that's that's that's. Um, these are parameters for the neural network. Now we wanted to make this as simple as possible for the average Java developer. So we, we give you a default neural network architecture. And the and nine times out of ten, the only thing you're the only thing that you're tweaking is the width and height of the image. Now, for those that are data scientists and, and statistics people, you can start tweaking these other things to control the neural net. Right, but we give you a um, sort of like a basic neural neural net architecture file that you can use just out of the gate. So you can you only have to change this image you know, within height. So um, that's this is a file that probably would take the most data sciencey, but there there are a set of defaults that we give you. But uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think that's. It for now. Um, hold on one second. Yeah, a couple comments in the in the chat, but oh yeah, sorry. And then Andrew was asking if there had been a comparison um, between a Python model and a Java model with the same problem, like to compare and contrast. Right. So so uh, we are working at uh, ways of taking. Um, actually, there are industry efforts, not just our efforts, but there's um there's a it was Onyx O N N X. 
So there's an effort that I, th I think Microsoft started, but now all these companies are are on board. Is that obviously the the, the model file is is critical, right? So it'd be nice if that was in some sort of standard format. I mean, this was talked about way in the beginning, like a couple of years ago. Like we better standardize the model format because how are we going to create a model in Python and use it in Java? So so the Onyx um, the Onyx um, initiative is one way of doing that. If you follow their standard, you create this file using their standard. That means any language can use those models and and deploy them, whether it's you know Python can create the model and Java can use the model.